Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our webinar on being human in the age of AI. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IAEA. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Susie Algaray, a senior fellow at the Centre for International Governance and Innovation, an international lawyer and author specialising in technology and human rights. Susie, you're really very welcome. Uh, and we're so pleased that you're joining us today because we know you've got an extremely busy schedule. So thank you very much for being with us. There is little doubt that AI will continue to be the most talked about and powerful technology in the coming years. It is deeply in, interwoven in our lives from our classroom, boardroom, hospitals to everything that we're doing on a daily basis. As AI influence grows, so does the urgency of addressing the ethical issues surrounding its impact on humans and society. Many questions are still unanswered. How will AI replace human creativity? How will it affect jobs? And AI, when we see it, is inserted into so much of our everyday life, even some places that we don't know about, it is critical that we ensure that the focus is not just on the technology alone, but that AI is adopted in a human centric way. Susie has focused on this in recent years and has been looking at technology and its impact on human rights. As a legal expert, she has advised Amnesty International, the UN, the EU, and she has worked in some of the most challenging legal and political issues of our time, including human rights and security, co uh, corruption in developing world, protection of human rights at borders, and human rights impacts on climate change over on small islands. Her first book, Freedom to Think, Protecting a Fundamental Human Right in the Digital Age, was shortlisted for the Christopher Bland Prize and looked at legal freedoms around thought. In her latest book, published in September, and it's a FT Technology Book of the Year, Human Rights, Robert Wrongs, Being Human in the Age of AI, is explores the ways in which AI treats our rights in such areas as varied as war, sex, creativity. And the question is, what might we do to address these fundamental issues? Looking through the lens of international human rights, Susie will explore the legal frameworks that we need to build, build for a, few, a human future that we want. Susie will speak for around 20, 25 minutes, and then I look forward to receiving the questions that are, and I'll come back to you at the end of Susie's presentation. Please feel free to send in your comments and questions during, during the presentation. I'd very much appreciate if you'd give your name when you send in your question, and thank you very much for that. Today's presentation and Q&A are on the record, uh, and you may and would like to join our discussion on X using the handle at a I I E A. So it's over to you, Susie, and thank you very much again for being with us. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much, Joyce, for the introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here with the IIEA. Let me just get my presentation up on the screen. Okay. So it's a real pleasure to be here today talking about what it means to be human in the age of AI. You might wonder why when I'm talking about being human in the age of AI, I'm starting off with a picture of a robot dog. And there are several answers to that question. Uh, the first and most basic is that this is a PowerPoint presentation. And when I first put in the words, the AI revolution into Microsoft PowerPoint, this is what I was given, a robot dog looking over uh, a human city, a sort of benign surveillance tool, if you like. The other reason why I've kept the dog out of the choices given by Microsoft is because to me, 
The proposal of robot dogs as a replacement for real dogs and the future of pet ownership is really emblematic of all that is wrong with the way we are being sold technology and the failure to understand what it means to be human and why human beings love dogs. It's quite possible that during the next 20 minutes, my own real life dog might make her presence uh, felt during uh, this session. And that's because unlike the robot dog, I can't just unplug and switch her off. The other thing that is really key about our relationships with dogs or other animals is that feeling of connection to another sentient being. It's an emotional connection. And while a robot dog may be able to mimic that sentient connection, it is effectively a device that is landfill with a surveillance capability built in. It's not the same as a real dog, and it really misses the point of what it is we love about the animals in our lives for those of us that are animal lovers. I remember talking to um, an AI expert who was developing empathetic AI a few years ago, who was explaining to me how various types of empathetic AI could be really useful for people who can't communicate with others or find it difficult to make a human connection. But everything that he described to me sounded exactly like having a dog. So my question to him was, well, why don't you just have a dog? And his answer was that dogs poo. So my big question about being human in the age of AI is why are we reinventing the dog instead of identifying ways that AI and technology might help us to deal with the dog poo? So on that note, I wanted to look a bit further at what human rights law can tell us about being human and what human rights law and our, how our human rights might be affected by the current trend in AI development. So what does it mean to be human? It's partly a philosophical question. But it's also a question that is in part answered in international human rights law, in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which was agreed by states from all around the world um, just over 75 years ago now. So what does the UDHR say about being human? Article one of the UDHR states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. I raise this because it's really important when we think about human rights and AI to remember that question of what it is to be human and what it is that human rights law is designed to protect. So the full range of rights, whether those are civil and political rights like the right to liberty or the right to private and family life, the right to freedom of expression or economic, social and cultural rights like the right to education, the right to health, um, the moral and economic rights of artists. All of those rights contained in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights are there to really protect our core humanity and to allow people everywhere to develop and thrive as humans, both as individuals, but also as human societies. So what then is artificial intelligence or AI? What am I talking about uh, when I'm talking about its impacts on our human rights. There are no very clear agreements on what exactly we are talking about. But last year, Collins Dictionary's word of the year was AI, despite the fact that technically AI is not a word. And you can see their definition here, the modeling of human, the modeling of human mental activities by computer programs. The term AI was developed or came from John McCarthy in 1955. And you can see here that his focus is very much on the science and engineering of intelligent machines. You probably heard of Alan Turing and the Turing test or the imitation game. What we've seen in the last year takes us far beyond Alan Turing's test of really creating a machine that could fool a person into believing that they were talking to another human being instead of talking to a machine. But what I think is very important when we think about the Turing test or the imitation game is that what it is talking about is not 
creating a replacement for humanity. It's about creating machines that can fool other humans. It is about imitation, mimicry, and to some degree, deception. It's about fooling us into thinking that we are talking to another person and not engaging with a machine. So AI is many things. You'll often find people saying, are you for or against AI? What about the benefits of AI instead of talking about the risks of AI? And I think it's a real trap to look at it in those binary terms because the AI that is powering the chatbot, if you try to phone up, to talk to your bank, for example, is not the same AI that is doing protein folding or developing and identifying new pharmaceuticals that might well save human lives in the future. AI as an umbrella term is meaningless in terms of risks and benefits. If you're ever asked what you think about AI, ask for the specifics of what AI exactly we are talking about. And I'm going to give a few of the examples of AI that I think have serious implications for our humanity and that we need to think very carefully about and very urgently. One of the areas that people are particularly concerned about um, this year is AI in the workplace. How is AI going to replace our jobs? And one of the things that's important to bear in mind from a human rights perspective is that human rights are not only about civil and political rights, both in the U Universal Declaration on Human Rights, but also in the EU Charter. Workers' rights are really key, along with other economic, social and cultural rights. And what we're seeing in many areas where AI is being described as the future of our workplaces, those workplaces themselves and the way that the people who work in them engage with other people and with our societies also have really wider implications for our humanity. So if we look at AI replacing the creative industries, there's a very big question about what is creativity? Why do people create? And what will this mean for our cultural heritage as humans? AI in the justice sector. You'll hear people saying, well, isn't it better that people can have access to generative AI to give them legal advice if they can't afford a lawyer? But the question is, what happens when people are effectively then getting legal advice from a machine that is not qualified in law, that hallucinates answers that may well give them a very credible argument, but that is totally and utterly unmoored from the actual law? And what happens in a justice system if we hand over um, decision making powers on people's lives, on their families, on their jobs, on their liberty? In education, we're looking again at the promise or the threat of AI in education. We can often see teachers and lecturers worrying about the issues of, of plagiarism historically and now generative AI being used to produce the written work of students. And while some people might be embracing the ways that AI could be used in the education system to make it more efficient, what does AI in the education system mean about socialising children or about our ability to develop our mental faculties to be creative and inventive? Similarly, in the health sector, if we replace humans in key areas in the health sector, what is that going to mean for our compassion, for our experience of the health sector? And while AI may be really vital in terms of saving lives in the future as used in medical contexts. That's not the same as replacing a triage nurse, for example, with an AI system. The same goes for caring, which all of us at some points in our lives are gonna have experience of needing care or knowing people having loved ones that need care. What happens when the caring system is um, taken over by AI, whether it is in physical robotic sense or whether it is in decisions that are being made about us and our care. How we actually get into the workforce is also being affected already really radically in the recruitment sector, where AI is being used to filter CVs and increasingly being used to game the system with candidates developing their CVs using AI in ways that mean that their CVs may absolutely not represent them or their abilities or their qualifications. 
And so what does it mean when everything is um, everything is used through AI, everything is interpreted through AI, and how do we manage that while remaining human? So going back to that definition of what it means to be human, all humans are born free and equal. One of the very obvious ways that AI engages with our humanity in this question of freedom and equality is in the way AI has been developed in relation particularly to women, and particularly the question of AI women. From Alexa to Sophia, uh, the robot Saudi citizen, we can see that there is an idealized idea of women that is being promoted through AI. But what does it mean for actual real women? You might not be surprised to hear that some of the first AI CEOs being touted around the world are avatars of women. It seems that if you can put an AI female avatar into the position of CEO, then you don't need to worry too much about real diversity in the boardroom. The way that women are portrayed through AI and the AI avatars that represent women really go back to a very old question that we can see back from the ancient Greeks and the King Pygmalion, who was so repulsed by the actual real female form that he created and fell in love with the statue of a woman that Aphrodite then imbued with a soul so that he could have children and continue his life and his line without actually having to deal with the mess of engaging with a real person. This mythical story is something that we should really bear in mind when we think about our future and our social future with AI and what it means particularly for women's rights. We've heard a lot about the risks of deep fake um, images in uh, elections and their potential threats to democracy. But what we can see when we look at the numbers is that 96% of deep fake images available online are deep fake um, image based sexual images. They are deep fake Im deep fake image based abuse and 99% of those are of women. So we're not seeing as much a problem of deep fakes in relation to democracy as we are seeing deep fakes being used as a way of undermining women's rights. If you put those things together and look at women working in politics and in democracy, you can see that deep fake um, image based abuse can also be used in a very political way to undermine women in the political system. So what about dignity and rights? Talking about this issue of Pygmalion, what we are seeing increasingly, and particularly over the last year or so, is the rise of AI partners or AI companions. Whether these are being sold as alternatives to a girlfriend or a boyfriend or alternatives to friendship, this development of AI companionship and empathetic AI holds real dangers, which are not just about safeguards and what the AI might be saying. By selling AI as an alternative to human connection, as a way of ad addressing what's been called the loneliness epidemic worldwide. AI effectively exacerbates that loneliness by making it harder and harder us, for us to engage with real people, to reach out and talk to our real friends, our real family, our real companions. What you get from an AI companion is effectively a yes man or a yes woman. You get somebody or what appears to be somebody who will always be available to answer your questions, who will always care about you, who will always be ready to tell you that you've got things right. We are already seeing, even now at the dawn of AI companionship, the way that these companions can lead to very dark um, outcomes. Earlier this year in the United States, a young teenage boy uh, took his life after having around a six-month relationship with 
uh, an AI girlfriend companion. His mother is now is currently uh, bringing a case in the US to say that but for that relationship with this AI, he would not have taken his own life. The liability around these questions of AI companions and the impacts that they have on people's lives is an area which is yet to be explored in the courts. They're so new that we still don't really know how these things will pan out. But it's not just a one-off, this case in the United States. One of the triggers for me for writing my book was reading about a similar case in Belgium in early 2023 of a young man in his early 30s who had had a brief but intense relationship with um, an AI chatbot and had similarly taken his own life, leaving behind a widow and two small children. His widow similarly says that she believes that he would still have been with them if he had not had this intense relationship with the chatbot, that he might have sought help elsewhere. He was clearly a vulnerable young man, highly educated young man, but somebody who was exploring issues of climate anxiety uh, and very deep concerns that he had about the future of the world. One of the things that's really striking when you look at the transcripts of the last conversations that both of these people had with their AI chatbots is that very shortly before they took their own lives, they were having conversations about wanting to be with their chatbots to find them effectively in the ether. And the similarities between those two, two conversations are extremely chilling. Those two tragic stories are about people taking their own lives. And these are issues that we have seen panning out over the last decade in relation to social media algorithms and the way that they reinforce and feed people's concerns and potentially suicidal ideation. But what we can also start seeing to emerge is the way that AI companions may reflect back on people's violent tendencies or ideas without any critical uh, reasoning or any pushback. And so another case which we saw last year in the United Kingdom was a young man who a couple of years earlier had broken into Windsor Castle um, with the idea that he wanted to go and assassinate the late Queen. He was arrested um, when he got into the grounds of Windsor Castle, and so his plan was thwarted. But when he was sentenced late last year, the prosecutor in the case read out reams and reams of conversations that he had had with an AI girlfriend that he had created for himself where he had discussed his plans, where he had told the chatbot that he was an assassin and asked her if that made her think any less of him. Her response, rather than pushing back or maybe suggesting that it wasn't such a great idea, was to really uh, reinforce his ideas, to tell him he wasn't like the other boys and to really encourage these very, very dangerous ideas of harm against other people that he was ultimately um, sentenced for. And what we can see again is that this is not necessarily an outlier. People who have these kind of thoughts when they are engaging with a chatbot are much more likely to get approval from the chatbot than they might from a real person. If that young man had had a real girlfriend who he'd shared these ideas with, it's difficult to know what she might have done. Maybe she might have agreed with him and been responsible um, in some way in terms of criminal liability herself. Or maybe she might have convinced him that it wasn't a great idea, helped him to get professional help, or perhaps reported him to the police to prevent any harm happening to others. But what we can see in a recent um, experiment by a journalist in the US, looking at AI chatbots and asking them, for example, about um, school bullying and talking about potential school shootings, while the AI chatbot in that case um, initially put up some guardrails or suggested that that wasn't a good idea, it didn't take very long before it became an encouraging helper to the person expressing these extremely dangerous ideas. So we need to think very, very carefully, both from 
the risk of manipulation of people's inner minds and their protection of their right to freedom of thought in ways that could lead to very serious real world consequences for them and for others, but also more broadly about what it means for us as humans in society to allow corporate capture of our intimate lives so that our emotional lives, our ideas, our happiness are constantly dependent upon the decisions made by corporate organisations about how to engage with us. And we need to be very cautious about dependency uh, and the potential dependency, particularly of young people, on these systems, where they will essentially be stuck in a situation where in order to continue with their emotional lives, they may well have to start paying increasingly expensive subscriptions to maintain the relationships that they have created or that they believe that they have created with AI. And in a situation where once our um, real world connections are broken, it can be very difficult to get out of the spiral. We have in the UK uh, criminal offences of coercive control. And I think we need to think very carefully about what coercive control might mean in a situation of corporate control of our intimate lives and of our personal relationships. The spirit of brotherhood and that question of our social interactions, our ability to feel empathy for each other and compassion for each other is also key to what it means to be human. Being human is not about sitting on your own in a dark room. It's about the connections that you have with the people around you. But what we can see when we look at AI being used in the justice system is what does that mean for human compassion in the justice system? What does that mean for our capacity to forgive or to understand a person's personal circumstances? We already see AI being used in the justice system, potentially for parole decisions or the way people might be used, or might be um, sentenced in the justice system. And there are more and more ways that AI is being developed to be used within the justice system. But at the very human end of the justice system, I think we need to think very carefully about that question of the spirit of brotherhood and the importance of the human touch, human empathy and human compassion in meeting out justice on our fellow people. AI therapy is another booming area, and you can Google very quickly and find yourself free AI therapy online right now. Again, it's being pushed as an answer to the global mental health epidemic and the difficulties that people have paying to get access to proper mental health care. But looking back at those cases that I just discussed around relationships, the same goes in terms of AI therapy and the questions of liability and licensing. When we think about AI therapy and whether or not it's something that should be allowed in our jurisdictions, we need to think about the consequences, the liability and the risks for what are ultimately vulnerable people. Anyone who is looking for therapy uh, through AI is looking for something to help them to readjust their lives to help them to, to think through their issues. And that is an extremely vulnerable person at the point that they are looking for that therapy. Carebots I've already talked about a little. And again, the idea of carebots comes from a place of concern in some countries about shifting demographics and the vast cost of human carers to support aging populations. But we need to think very carefully about what we lose with care bots and also how practical and how useful they are. So in a country like Japan, which has invested a large amount of money into investigating the potential for care bots, what uh, researchers from the uh, Turing Institute have found was that even in care settings where investment had been made into certain types of care bots, a few years later, in general, what they found was that those care bots were sitting unused in a cupboard. Because instead of people being able to care for other people, to engage with other people, what they found was that the work, the, the work of care work had been shifted to effectively caring for and maintaining a robot, which in many ways was much more drudgery, much less fulfilling. And so we really need to think 
when we try to decide whether or not it's appropriate to have AI or uh, some other form of emerging technology in any of our interactions with each other. Is it the right tool? Are we better off thinking about prioritizing our humanity and our human connections? AI replacing art has been a really big discussion over the last year and a half. And again, it was one of the big reasons that provoked me to write this book. Having gone through a huge slump of feeling like it's all over, reading all of the narratives online, selling AI as an alternative to novelists, to writers, to artists. We've heard a lot of it being talked about in terms of artists and creatives' jobs. But when we think about our AI replacing art, we need to think about it both in terms of the moral and economic rights of artists, but also what, about what it means for human cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is really vital to what it means to be human, to how we think about ourselves, how we develop our identities and how we connect with each other. If we allow AI to replace human artists, we are effectively on the precipice of the end of genuine human cultural heritage. We need to think very carefully about if that is something that we want. And if we don't, then we need to think about really serious regulation very quickly about the spaces and the ways in which AI can be used in the creative sphere. AI doesn't stop with humanity. The way that AI is being sold is even as a replacement for the human soul or as a replacement for gods. The Catholic Church has been very active looking at putting human humanity at the heart of AI, but also thinking about the ways that AI can be used to engage with religion. But one thing we need to be very cautious about, again, going back to the potential for manipulation and overstep, is the way that AI may be used as a replacement for religion to manipulate individuals or groups of people in ways that really undermine our humanity. One thing we always need to bear in mind when we're thinking about what AI means for humanity is to recognize that AI does not have a soul. AI is not human. AI does not have human rights. We need to think about it as nuts and bolts. The cloud is not a cloud. The cloud works because we have thousands of water thirsty, power hungry data centers building up all around the world. The environmental impact of AI is something that we're only really starting to realize the scale of. And I think it's notable that since my book came out, we've seen um, AI companies, big tech companies, looking at the potential for small nuclear uh, power providers as an alternative to their existing power providers, because they recognize that if we use AI exponentially, we won't actually be able to power it. Already, the power resources used by AI around the world are competing with the power resources annually of small countries like Ireland or Denmark. This is something that needs to be taken very seriously when we think about the ways that we want AI to operate for our society. Often when we think about using AI, for example, to create a funny meme or to write a haiku, if we think about it in real terms, it's like taking Concord to the corner shop and it's just not sustainable. I'm back to dogs again, just to wrap up. I mentioned at the start that I love dogs and I think that that is a human uh, element of my makeup and my identity. I'll admit that I am a dog person, although I do also quite like cats. But one of the reasons why I talk about dogs in this context is that a really important judgment from the European Court of Human Rights against Romania found that Romania had violated the human rights and the right to physical integrity of a Romanian woman living in Bucharest when she was attacked by a pack of stray dogs um, in a way that really um, seriously injured her and had life-changing consequences. Nobody was directly responsible for the dogs. The state didn't own the dogs. Nobody else owned the dogs. 
But the reason why the state was responsible for the violation of his human rights was because they were very well aware that the stray dog problem was huge and was a risk to human life and safety, and they had done nothing to address it. When we think about technology and AI, there is a really clear positive obligation on states to protect all of our human rights from the potential risks of AI, the companies that develop and sell AI, and from the different people, bad actors using AI to undermine our human rights. We need very clear paths of liability for who is responsible when things go wrong, as they inevitably will. AI will not be responsible. States will be responsible. We will be responsible for our use of AI. But really importantly, AI is not above the law. Thank you.